Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. This is Kenrick Green, actor from The Walking Dead and other things. And I'm hanging with Galaxy here on Comic-Con Radio. Thanks for listening. need to stop and bandage him up. No. We keep moving. I'm okay. You won't be if we don't stop your bleeding. Leave me. Leave us. No. That's stupid for you guys to wait on me. We'll all go down. Come on, man. Wake up. You don't want to do it now. You do it out there. We get into trouble again, you run. And you don't look back. No, if we go, we go together. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. This is Galaxy signing in for Comic-Con Radio. Coverage of pop culture events from around the globe. Amazing interviews with celebrities. Daily recaps and reviews of popular television. Movie reviews. Everything Comic-Con and fandom from around the globe. Comic-Con Radio. Get ready to enter our universe. Let's go. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. This is Galaxy for another amazing episode of Comic-Con Radio. Today we have a really great guest. This gentleman has been kicking butt in the apocalypse for almost, what, half a decade? Something like that. Who's counting? Today, we have the really cool and wonderful Kenrick Green on Comic-Con Radio. Kenrick, what's up, brother? Welcome to Comic-Con Radio. What's up? What's up? What's up? Thank you. Thank you for having me. This is going to be fun. Yeah, it's going to be very fun. We have a lot of questions, and I know the fans out there, and there's a lot of them. They want to ask these things, but they can't, so I'm going to do it for them. <laughs> All right. Well, let's see. I'll do my best to answer. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know what? We're going to get into the show a little bit. We'll also get into other things. So you are from Detroit. <laughs> well, yeah, I was born in Detroit, but we moved to Southern California when I was six. So it's like Detroit, I'm in the soil of Detroit, but I don't have that like adult relationship with it like I would. I I did. Hey, you know what? Southern California is absolutely amazing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm not complaining. I can't complain. Everybody's <laughs> born somewhere, right? We're all born somewhere, and right. then we move. And you can claim that as your history and your life. So, born in Detroit, moved to Southern California. Yeah. You're a little dude. Was acting in your mindset, or was it sports? Oh no! When I was young, it was uh, it was basketball all the way. Like I discovered it in third grade. And I was pretty good at the time. Like I was, you know, I had kind of like a natural going to basketball camp. For a brief second, I was deluded enough to think that I was going to go to the NBA one day. But then I quit in high school. And right before I graduated, I did my first play and I came to acting. So you were this guy wanting to become an NBA star. And then you got into acting. It was such a big change. You know, some people aren't like basketball. They're like, OK, I'm going to go to football or something else. But you just went straight to acting. What caused that? Well, it was a really fast tragic well not tragic it felt tragic in my emotions at the time but i was basically i was playing basketball and i got to a point like i said i was kind of natural like i was a natural right and i didn't really play people older than me to challenge me and so i came up against kind of a point in high school where i wasn't the tallest guy i wasn't the fastest guy i didn't jump the highest i didn't do that and i was challenged in a way that I wasn't ready for because I didn't seek it out when I was younger. It got to the point where I wasn't the best, 
things were getting difficult. I was messing up. I was failing a lot. And I remember going to my parents being like, you know, I think I want to quit basketball. You know, my dad was like, oh, you don't want to quit. You know, you got to keep working. You got to do this. But my mind was already made up. And I just wanted to be a regular student instead of having to get to school at six in the morning for zero period practice before you go through the full day of school. You got to practice after. Like I hadn't had that experience. I just got my license, wanted to drive. I was like, you know, I don't be a regular student. And uh, me and my best friend, he left around the same time. So we were just chilling. And then he was the one who saw this kind of casting call for this play our high school was doing before we graduated. And this is like a year after I quit. And he's like, hey, man, this play, we can wear suits, there's girls, like, we should try it. And I was like, oh, okay. And I was a pretty shy kid. But I went, got a little small part. And that was kind of my introduction into it, you know, just to see like, oh, what's this acting thing about? I kind of like being up here on stage and telling a story. Wow. Yeah. You went from such a certain mindset to such a different mindset because those are two different types of people. A hardcore athlete oh, that yeah. wants to go to the NBA has a certain mindset and then someone that wants to be an actor. So at that time when you liked acting, it was just theater. It was like movies in mind. No, no, it was just this play. Because I mean, the idea of me being an actor was totally, you know, like foreign. That was something I would never do. Cause like I said, I was pretty shy. I was quiet. Like I used to be so shy to the point, like I would hate showing up to class after the bell rang for whatever reason, because everybody would turn and look in my direction and it would make me like ah, I wish I could disappear and my family was shocked and everything when I was like hey I want to do this play because the play is called Guys and Dolls it's a musical so they're like well you're about to be singing and dancing and all that and I was like no 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 I don't sing and dance but I got this little part I'm in a phone booth it was opposite the lead of the musical and after one production this older guy because I went to school in Upland California by the way just to kind of give us more of a specific location and this older guy he came to me after one of our shows that weekend and he said out of all the people on the stage you're the actor you know and I heard that and I was like wow man that's nice I don't know what he sees but I'll take it you know so he saw so, you he saw your talent he was like you're the actor you're the one that sold the best on stage yeah that's what he said and, and I had like a tiny part you know, like I said, it's just one scene, but people laughed and it, it worked out. And I was like, hey, you know what, I got to I gotta explore this a little further. Maybe there's something here. For someone to come out and say, hey, you're an actor, you have this talent, it must have really triggered something in your mind towards this way. That's amazing. And here's the thing. Everybody comes from different families, but when you come from a family where everybody's set on you to become like a sports athlete superstar, and then you want to get into theater and acting mm -hmm. and stuff like that, were you a little embarrassed to tell your family that? Or you weren't? Were you hiding things a little bit at one point? No, you know, it's funny. Looking back at it in hindsight, my mom basically forced me and my dad to go see this play at the community theater in Upland, right? And I was like 14, maybe. So they're still playing basketball theater and, and acting's furthest thing from my mind. But I remember trying to beg her, like, please, I don't want to go. It's stupid. I don't want to see it. And I went anyway. It was Big River, right? Here we go, another musical. Even though, like I said, I don't sing or dance. But I had the best time after I saw it. And I was like, wow, this is incredible. You know, like seeing actors live up there on stage. And I remember waking up the next morning, like trying to sing the songs or trying to act like the guy who was playing Huck Finn. But it didn't even click then, even though it's like, here I am. You know, it's kind of like the seed forming, but I didn't realize, I really didn't acknowledge it because I was like, that's not my reality pursuing it. Being an actor is like, nah, not me. Nobody in my family's done that, you know? Wow. Yeah. Such a good thing to remember now that you go back and you're like, okay, this must have been some stepping stone into what I'm doing right now. So all that stuff said, you know, high school, things change. You get into theater acting, you go into college. Well, I'll tell you. So I went to a community college. I was like, let me find out what this acting thing is all about. Went to Mount Sac Community College. Got to be kind of like a big fish in a very small theater pond. And I reached a point, like you said, I'm in California. What better place? But I reached a point where I had to ask myself, like, am I ready to pursue professionally or do I need to get kind of more involved in depth training? And I opted for training, and a lot of actors at the time that I would kind of study and admire seemed like a lot of them studied in New York City. That's what took me out there. Got my audition for conservatory, got in, graduated, did a lot of theater out in New York and on the kind of East Coast. And then when I met my wife, it was obviously fast-forwarding some time, but I met her doing a play at the McCarter Theater, and she was kind of the first actor that I knew that I could actually talk to who had done any kind of TV and, and film work and stuff. And so I started looking into that because she was the one who kind of exposed it to me up close, you know, and I was like, ah, all right. And I realized, you know, like TV and film, it's easier to make a living 
going that route rather than trying to just be an actor on the stage exclusively. You know, that's kind of how I arrived there to the kind of television and film side of things. So basically you met her during a production of Fetch Clay. That's right, yeah. And you get on this mindset that it's easier to work in TV and movies, pays better. Theater's amazing. A lot yeah. of people that have a great theater background are hugely successful. It's two different things. It's very different from each it other. It is. It's, yeah, it's two different things. But I'm not saying it's easier to do TV and film. It, it's not. It's a totally different beast than trying to do theater. Absolutely. Um, but yes, yeah, definitely it's not easier. <laughs> I just want to make sure that that's clear. Like, <laughs> that's not what I'm trying to say. Yeah. I just had to go that route. It's like, different. I'm saying it's easier for any actor out there listening. <laughs> that's not the case. So we'll say yeah. this. It's not easy. It's just different. Let's just put it at that. <laughs> there we go. I can live with that. There, you can live with that. So you meet mm -hmm. Sonequa. You guys hit it off. You guys tied a knot. You're on this journey. And then after 2010, huge things happen in your career, right? You land on The Walking Dead. Right. Fast forward yes. a few years up. People that are listening out there, all the fans, there's a struggle period for everyone. You know, unless you're very lucky and you get seen, but it doesn't, I don't think, happen like that. Like the movies where you get picked up on a street no. and you become a superstar the next day, right? It takes many years of hard work and all that stuff. So oh, yeah. you're on the set of The Walking Dead. You're looking around. What's going through your mind? Well, I mean, it was a crazy journey. And I know usually you don't like getting into the struggling years, but I, just like the journey of where where she and I were sneak when I started, like when we got married shortly after that, like we were two out of a total of six people in an apartment, the bedroom that we were living in was maybe, I don't know, 10 feet by 10 feet. And we were living off of like $40 a week in, in groceries. And, you know, cause I mean, we were broke as broken, broke as, as broke gets like it, <laughs> it was crazy. And then to fast forward about a year and a half from that point, she was on the show on walking dead first. She recurred season three, then got picked up as a regular season four. And, you know, we were just kind of together going on this ride. You know, I started at season six and I've been recurring ever since season six. I'm technically not a regular on the show. And yeah, and it was, I mean, it just like, I don't know, it's kind of like the floodgates opened as far as what you learn from a business standpoint, you know, the, the work that goes into being a regular on a TV series and especially a, a, a series like Walking Dead, which has reached as, almost as high a height as I think a TV show can get. And yeah, you're just kind of whisked away. All of a sudden you're on planes and you need better suitcases and you're tired because you got to work till three in the morning, then get on a plane at six in the morning and then hit the ground running because there's no time to rest, you know, and all this stuff. It's like, what is it? What's happening? What is this life? Isn't that cool though? Because the both of you seen to struggle like you said you live with like 10 people you lived in a smaller room you had 40 bucks a week you guys struggled and seen that because here's the thing a lot of people look at you guys and like wow what a beautiful couple you guys are doing so well blah 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 all this stuff but if they knew exactly what you went through and that bond that was built and that thing that formed years ago in what New York, New Jersey, where you guys were just struggling and trying and the no's and the yeses and the maybes and all that. And then finally she gets a break and then you get a break. And then now it's like, boom, life is yeah. amazing. Life is great. Yeah. Walking Dead is more than iconic. It's a TV series that's uh, like part of history. It's like part of pop Pop culture it's life children were born into it and yeah. it, it's amazing but it's also great to hear where you came from because here's the thing your parents never want you to go through that kind of struggle your parents want you to go to college make money and do well but that struggle you went through is because you put yourself through that because of this art form that you love, which is acting. And it's so great to hear, yeah. man. I really love those kind of stories. The fans love it. So you guys went through the struggle phase. She lands a gig on Walking Dead. You land a gig on Walking Dead. Then things get busy. How was it working on the set your first year? Was there a lot of adjustments? Were you learning a lot? Oh man, it was, yeah, it was a huge adjustments. Like there's a few things going on there, right? Because my wife had already been kind of established. I'd already known everybody, even though I hadn't been on set with them working. So when I started season six, season five, Sonequa was pregnant the whole time. And that show is not as far as like the conditions you work under because we're outside in, in rural Georgia in the middle of summer. You know, it's like, it's not an easy show 
to work on just physically. Like you're out there, the heat is beating on you, the sweat's getting in your eyes. You got to keep applying sunscreen every hour. You know, you're, you're running through the woods. The ticks are real. You know, the bug bites are real. Sometimes we're just like showering ourselves in bug spray just to, to keep them away just so you can work. And they're not like trying to fly in your mouth and in your ears and, and all this stuff. Right. And so one of my first days on set, we're at this like rock quarry. So there's no overhead coverage, no shade. The sun is just beating down. It's, it's bouncing off the rocks and just hitting. And I'm, I'm like leaned over in between, in between takes, like, man, I'm hot. Like I gotta, you know, I gotta uh, like get it together. And I look over at Sonequa and she's just kicking it. You know, and I'm like, here I am, I'm on set. One of the few times we're actually on set at the same time with our respective characters. And she's just used to it because she's been there already. And not only is she used to it, she also did a full season of this pregnant before I'm there. So I was like, I have no room to sit here and act like I'm hot, act like I'm thirsty, anything. I was like, she went through a whole season, you know, creating a baby, <laughs> you know, and got through it just fine. And I'm over here like, oh, it's burning. The sun's so hot. I need a break. You know, like, get it together, Kendrick. Get it together. You know. <laughs> you were saying that, uh, get it together. And you were watching her. That's amazing, yeah. though. So she went through a whole season pregnant. I remember that season and how she rocked it that yeah. season. Um, she was very emotional. So I don't oh, know yeah. if it was a pregnancy or she was just like pushing extra hard. But that was amazing. They love you guys comboing it. It's become a thing now. Yeah. Seeing you guys together. I hope one day you guys write movies and other things together so you can uh, create and, and satisfy the lovely people in the universe. Our times to like actually like work on stuff together is, is so few and far in between. And we produced a little with some friends, this digital series called Wedlock. And we got to play a married couple opposite the main characters in an episode, which, you know, when she and I get to, you know, get to, we call it playing together. Yeah, you know, it's just fun because we don't, we don't get to do it. You know, we've appeared in two different television shows at the same time, but still have yet to, I think, even make eye contact on camera. You know, I, I don't think that's happened yet. It is, you know, we, we will. We, we plan to, you know, create some things where we can work together more, more intimately. The essence is there. Or at know, least more extensively. Yeah. Extensive. Yeah, well, the knowing, the knowing of you guys are there the same season, that's what really thrilled people, you know. So I heard this funny thing. I heard that she pushes you a lot. Health is very important. <laughs> and I heard she forced you on Instagram. She said, whether you're ready or not, I'm going to take a naked picture of you above the waist. And I'm going to show it to the world. <laughs> right. So you better get your butt ready. Was that true? <laughs> it, it, that, yes, yeah, there was, most of it's true. We are, we are health conscious. We, we were vegans for a minute. You know, we saw that documentary, What the Health? And it was just like, whoa, that, you know, it really like blew our minds. But, um, you know, we've since, you know, I, I've since kind of like gotten back into, you know, meat eating and everything and, and kind of going a different direction. And she has, too. But we're still very much very conscious of what we put in our bodies when we put it in, yada, yada, yada. But, yeah, like over, you know, over the course of our whole marriage, you know, we've been talking about like, oh, I got to get fit. I got to get a six pack. I got to do this. I got to do that. And after a while, you, you know, she was like, you know what? I'm about to light a fire under you. Like, I'm taking a picture of you with your shirt off. You got four months and it's going on Instagram. So you can be ready or not. I don't care, but it's going up there. And I was like, mm, well, I'm not trying to be embarrassed out here. So let me let me get myself together, <laughs> you know, and she it worked. You know, it worked. I, I, I had to do it. And she she held me to it. And we do. We try to we try to push each other. We try to, you know, um, make each other better, try to help the other get to the thing they say they want to get to, even though it may not be the easiest thing or it may not be, um, <laughs> you may not be uh, very popular as you try to push the person toward their goal, but it's like, hey, we're here, we're here to, um, to kind of maximize our potential together and, and be, you know, be that friend, be that encouragement that you need to be to the other. That's pretty cool, man. Well, that's a big motivation for a lot of couples out there um, you know, they're <laughs> right. going to start telling their husbands, hey, you better get your butt ready or else I'm going to put your picture to millions of people out there. <laughs> exactly. I'm blowing up your whole well, spot. Yeah, that was a good, 
That was a good Instagram day for a lot of people. Ladies out there, you can find that picture. Just go search it out. Uh oh. <laughs> uh oh. No, no, don't find it out. Hey. She's going to blast you. Hey. No. <laughs> she plays well, such. Out there, so I can't, you know. She has such a tough essence, Saniqua, to her. So imagine what you're going through at home, man. Do you sometimes <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> uh, feel like you better do it or else? Is that how you feel? <laughs> yeah, I know, right? It's like, listen, she's sniper people. We've watched her use hand-to-hand combat. We've watched her use the Vulcan grip to knock people out. You know, it's like, hey, I, I don't have any room for air. <laughs> <laughs> no. It's really, it's not the case. Let me be sure it's not the case. She, she treats me just fine at home. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> She's probably behind you, like, you better say, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> right. It's all good. It's all good. So, Walking Dead, right? You're still on it. I have a bunch of questions on that. Mr. Rick Grimes, uh, Andrew Lincoln, before and after, you were one of the few people or, you know, there's still a little handful of people that were pre and post Andrew Lincoln. How was it? with him and how is it without him on the show has it changed you think yeah it has you know he was incredible and he was obviously the kind of main architect from an actor standpoint about creating the world and the lens through which we experience this whole new reality you know the zombie apocalypse and when he was really like the great leader and he was doing this crazy intense work what was required of him during his time on the show was so involved But he still made time for each and every person that has come in and out of that show, which, you know, a good number of people over the years. And you feel like everybody's on equal footing when he was there and, you know, he'd come in and it didn't matter if you were there for a day or if you were a new regular or whatever. He always took a moment to say hello and talk to you and everything. And so you kind of had that warmth there. And that kind of permeated throughout and created this culture to where now even though he's not there every day. So you kind of miss Andy in the conversation. The, the culture lives on and everybody is still very welcoming. And it's like what we're doing and the story we're telling is so intense and violent that when the cameras aren't rolling, it's a very good, like happy set people. You know, everybody's nice. Everybody gets along. Everybody enjoys spending time with each other. So that has stayed true, you know, pre and or I'd say, you know, while we had Andy and post Andy, that's been there and and it's great. So in that way, he's still there on set every day with us. That's good to hear, man. Satisfies everyone. I hope that satisfied everyone out there. (laughs) (laughs) Right? You're known as the nice person on Walking Dead. You're the guy that's always Mm -hmm. reliable. You're always there. You're the the nice. Friendly neighborhood Alexandria. Friendly neighborhood guy. Tough. Gets the job done. (laughs) Help in every situation that I've seen on The Walking Dead since you've been there. You've been part of the rescue portion, the helping, the being there. Is that something that has become a thing? Because, you know, after a while, writers see the truth in an actor and they see things about them and they're like, wow, let me accentuate this part of this person. Yeah, and I remember when I first got cast, Scott Gimple, he was like, you know, Speaking of me, Kendrick, the actor, he's like, I know it's easy to kind of skew you as a bad guy and make you a villain of some type of, in some type of way. But I really do want to tap into that kind of kind, gentle spirit that you have and, you know, make you a good guy and make you somebody that people can rely on and feel safe with. And I want to look at that side of you. And it was like, oh, okay, great. Because he was right. You know, I do, I tend to play like, oh, the villain and all that, you know, because it's like, I'm tall, I got a deep voice, I got, you know. Like, I have the kind of boxes to check to be like, oh, man, bad guy. You know, watch out for that dude. <laughs> but, Jack you know, he, he really wanted to. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And and so, you know, he wanted to look at the other side. And that was very much on purpose. And being that loyal guy, it's so funny. Somebody on Instagram was like, oh, man, I saw you in this, you know, it's like I saw you in an episode of Walking Dead. Like, I was wondering, you know, where you were. And like, oh, yeah, it's the loyal soldier guy. Yeah. And I'm like. Yeah, that's me. You know, Scott's the loyal soldier guy. You know, he, <laughs> he is, especially like with Michonne, became kind of Michonne's right hand for a time. And it was like, oh, yeah, that's, that's what we're doing. That's where that's where it is. It's fun that so many people notice that. They actually mm-hmm. say it to you. And it's a great thing that it's like that. I'd rather you be that person that's beloved and loved than the person that they're like, oh, I hate this dude. Because, you know, yeah, I've I noticed on The Walking yeah. Dead, the people that are loved last 
even after for a long time. And the people that are like, you know, they could be kind of the enemies and people forget them really quick. They move on like the governor and so and so and so and so. That's a really cool trait. And uh, that's good. The world's noticing that. Yeah, it is cool. And I'm really grateful to have been around as long as I have been because I don't know if there was a plan from the beginning. But when I first came on, it was just for two episodes. And I didn't know anything beyond that. And as, you know, episode after episode was coming out and one season, the season would come, season would go, and I'm still around. I'm like, man, because I would look at, you know, my character based on the comic book. I'm I'm only there for a brief time in the comic. I end up dying due to an infection from a wound, not even a zombie bite or anything. And so I was like, oh, man, I guess, you know, this will be kind of a like a little cool thing. Like I did, I did a couple episodes and then I'll move on to something else. And here I am now almost five seasons later, or I should say five full seasons later, you know, still, still going. And, you know, it was just totally unexpected, you know, it was a total blessing, you know, but I just didn't, I didn't know that I was going to last this long and kind of become this cemented in the world at the time. Well, Here's the thing. You've been on five seasons. I think season eight was your busiest. You you were in a lot of episodes. Yes. And season 10, this latest episode, you're helping with the tree that fell over the fence. What do you think about the enemies now, the whispers? Do you think they're the creepiest out of all the seasons? You think they're the most formidable? Do you think they're the most ruthless? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I think so. Because we're dealing with an enemy that doesn't, operate by the same standard. They have adopted the kind of philosophy of this world in a totally different way. They want to walk with the walkers. They want to dwell among them. They, you know, they believe they're guides. And so they're, they're like, hey, this world is, is changing in a way, and we're just going to go with the flow. We're not going to fight to maintain anything that we had pre-breakout of the apocalypse. And in that way, it's like, oh, okay. So you're you're trying to embrace this and we're, we're fighting to maintain it. So no matter what, no matter what we, I don't know how far we go, what we see together. It's like, we're always going to look at it through two different, two different lenses. And it makes them that much more dangerous, that much more unpredictable because you can't even put yourself in their shoes. Cause it's like, I don't even know what you're thinking about this moment to even understand how you might react or where you might be or, so I, in that way, I think they are the most most ruthless, most deadly, like and and most complex villains that we've dealt with so Dang, far. That's cool. You know, people out there are shaking. Their yeah. pants are shaking when you say these things. <laughs> I hope you're affecting them that yeah. way. Hey, man, some fans yeah, love it to the like bone. You can't even see them. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it is. It's crazy. It's like yeah, you're looking at a you know like ten walkers are coming towards you, and it's like oh, there's a few of them might pull out a knife and slash your throat. Does it ever go through your mind that this could be true or is it true? Do you ever like get freaked out by it? Have you ever been freaked out by like you left the set? You're like, what What the hell? What if this was real? Did you ever has that ever crossed your mind? So Sneak and I were both fans of the show before either of us were on it. And so just like everybody else who I think, especially in those early seasons, you know, one of the things that the show really kind of made you do was imagine like, yo, this feels like it could happen like maybe one day this might be reality. How would I handle it? Would I just be able to kill the, you know, if you, if my wife turned into a walker, would I just be able to kill her? No problem. Or would I struggle like other people did? And it's funny, like now being on the show, kind of look behind the curtain and you see how, you know, how the sausage is made, so to speak. Since now you're pretending it's real on camera, there's no need to like imagine it as a fan and an audience member anymore. So it kind of changed in that way. So I used to, I used to, before I was on, I'd be like, "Hmm, what would I do? Like, what if this was real? And honestly, it'd be fun for me. I wouldn't walk around scared like, oh no, this person's going to get me. But it is fun to think about like, all right, I got to find like a position that's high. I got to get to a place where the walkers can't climb. You know, I got to make sure that I, you know, get get my family and all that, you know, make sure I got food, water. It is. I've gone through all of those things in my head. So you're you're a believer of the zombie. Well, look, I don't think it's going to happen, but if it does, I'm ready. You know what I mean? Like, I'd be ready. You know, I'm not dying on the first day. I had author Neil Cohen. He writes books about this apocalypse stuff. And he actually Mm -hmm. is a contractor for the government. The government hires him to write that if a breakout, like a virus breakout or a zombie breakout happens, this is what we should do. 
So you got to think sometimes if the government, the United States government is spending all this money hiring people to create scenarios like this, they might be afraid of something. So I don't know. You know, <laughs> I, know yeah, the- I know. Right. <laughs> I, yeah. In the back of your mind, you're like, I listen, it, it might. I'm not going to 100 percent rule it out. Yeah. And it, <laughs> it's true. And that's what's so great about the show. It, it caused everybody to really get into their imagination and and really think about like, man, what what would I do if this if this really happened? It oh, feels yeah. like it could happen. Maybe. What would I do? You know, and it's yeah, and it's I, I didn't know that about the government and this guy actually writing oh, out yeah. <laughs> scenarios. He, he, He's wow. a contractor for them. But he said one thing. He said the world might fall apart, but the government never will. He said if a hundred zombie apocalypses happen, the government itself will be stable. Maybe the people will die, but you know, I don't want to quote him, mm-hmm. but that's what he kind of said. So it makes you think that the government, of yeah. course, they're so powerful. They got all these like things. That's why when I watch the show sometimes, I'm like, there must be a hierarchy of government hiding somewhere that don't want to show their face because how can they go down? They have these submarines and these jets and all these space systems. They could just like go somewhere yeah. and hide and let everybody kill each other and then just come back out and say, hello, who's left over? Let's restart. Yeah, exactly. I know it does seem like that's very much a possibility. And I guess we'll see. <laughs> you're like, <laughs> Maybe we'll see that down the line. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> you're like, hey, man, I'm just on The Walking Dead. I don't create it. <laughs> oh, look, I, I think that would be I think that'd be fantastic to explore. The, the government was sitting lying in wait. It would know? be. So with that, has anything really creepy happened on set while you were there? You know what? Honestly, it's not exactly the angle you're looking at it from. But the weirdest things for me is to be on set and you see the walkers, you know, the actors dressed up as walkers in between takes or you, know, you got 10 <laughs> minutes before the next shot and they're just sitting there talking casually like they're not, you know, like, like they're not in walker makeup or they're not looking like a zombie as they're just like. Yeah, man, you know, after uh, after work, I got to get my dog and, you know, they got to go to the vet because, uh, you know, little Betty's sick again and all this. Like, <laughs> what are you talking about? <laughs> like, you know, or sitting there smoking a cigarette or drinking a Coke or, you know, you're like, this doesn't make sense in my mind. Like, <laughs> you look dead. Why are you enjoying a Coca-Cola? It you know, you and uh, <laughs> yeah, that that's the weirdest part. Because it's like this is because the makeup is so well done. Like when you have those walkers in your face, you just feel like you're being attacked by a zombie. It doesn't seem like, oh, that's an actor in makeup. In the moment, it's so well done up close that you're like, mm, I see a zombie. I don't really see a human being anymore. So it does. It messes with your head when you see them out of context. Oh, yeah. Greg Nicotero, that guy is amazing. He, uh, yeah, he's incredible. OMG. When I first heard about The Walking Dead and I heard that he's in charge of that, I was like, wow. And he's aged in this. Like, he's, like, gave so much of his life to this. And mm-hmm. it, it looks amazing. It looks wonderful. That's what I, I thought you were going to say as well. Like, seeing these zombies between takes, sitting down, you know, smoking a cigarette, drinking a coffee. And it probably trips your mind. Uh, have you ever got scared in a scene yeah. when you saw a zombie? Like, I know you know it's fake, but... Yeah. Yeah, I have. Because, you, you'll, you know, you'll just walk around the corner, walk around a tree, and, and somebody will be standing like, oh, hey, 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 man. And then they'll just be like, hi. You know, like, ah, all right, all right. <laughs> you're, you're good in there. Like you're a good. haunted house man. I mean, it is, but they're not even trying to be creepy. They're just, you know, living their own, you know, undead life. And <laughs> you're like, wow, you know, look at this walker on the cell phone. Um, I'm just sitting next to you. Cool, cool. You're not going to bite me, right? Okay, cool, cool. Yeah, so it's, it's funny. <laughs> so with that said, have you ever been to a Comic-Con event? Oh, yeah, several. Nice. Yeah, all types. You know, one, like, obviously, like, the, you know, the kind of big, like, San Diego, New York Comic Cons, which is more about, you know, being there, meeting fans and promoting the show. And then also at the Comic Cons where you're, you know, doing selfies and, and signing photos. Because they're two different experiences, those things. But, yeah, so I've done I've done both a number of times. That's wonderful. So when you were at Comic Con San Diego or wherever you were at, I bet you also went to Walker Stalker Con, all those things. How was the yeah, experience yeah. with the fans? Was it different? Were you like, wow? It was really an interesting journey because before we'd kind of gotten on the show and really before Sonequa started on the show, I had very, very little, if any, exposure to the kind of like Comic Con world. And so when she started on the show and we started hearing about these conventions where you could go and, you know, meet fans, people dress up and everything, it was like something I'd heard about, but, you know, I was like, 
uh, does that really happen? And so going in there, you know, first is just like the husband, you know, I'm watching her interact with fans and I'm watching people come up and say the most amazing things about the show and why they love it and why your character specifically left an impression or the moments that really spoke to them. It's like, man, this is really, this is more than just entertainment for some people. And then going from kind of witnessing that to being on the show myself, but it's such a large show. And, you know, there's people that it's like starting in season six, you know, there's a lot of characters that have been around longer than me. And to then come on the show as a kind of a, you know, a supporting character, you know, and a minor character, and then still having people come to my table, you know, cause I was under the impression like, Oh, you know, I'll get a few people here and there. It'll be nice to just say hello, snap a quick picture and move on. But like I had one of my first comic cons, I had a grown man come to my table crying. And I was like, what? For, to just happy to meet me. And I was like, me? Like what? You know, I just said, thank you. And was like, oh man, like, wow, this is, you know, it's amazing that you're sharing this moment with me and what, you know, what this means to you, what my character's meant to you within this story. And I was just shocked by that. You know, I was shocked at the kind of magnitude that people were being uh, impacted through this thing. Yeah, and I mean, I've had people tell me about uh, this one guy, young guy, he had to be like 21, 22, was talking about how The Walking Dead was responsible for him being successful through his rehab and getting over his crack addiction. And it's like, holy cow, like this show is literally saving some people's lives. You know, and I know that sounds like hyperbolic, but I've had people tell me the things that The Walking Dead has really helped usher them through. And, I, you know, I, who could expect that? Who could? But, I mean, I was floored to listen to these things. And that's why I really enjoy them when I when I get the opportunity to do them. Because like, when I decided I wanted to be an actor, I didn't realize that something could be that that impactful to, to people where it's literally saving their lives or helping them through the most difficult struggle they've ever, they've ever experienced. And it's like, wow, this is, this stuff is powerful. Like the show, the show is done. Yeah. Yeah. It's amazing hearing that. I see that all the time. We understand how the Comic-Con world works and the fans out there, they love these things like their life. And I call that the Michael Jackson moment. When I used to see Michael Jackson in concert, I would see grown people cry and faint. And when I was young, I was like, why is this person doing that? As I got older and I understood and I seen these things and you see how much these things mean to people that their body Mm -hmm. would just, they lose it because it affects them so much. And it's amazing that a TV series like that can affect someone towards good. It's really wonderful. It must feel so good for you and your wife and everybody to be part of these things that affects people in ways where it makes their life better. And it's really cool, man. And it probably changed your mindset Mm -hmm. too because back in the days, acting was just acting. Now actors have these conventions and have these bigger roles because of social media and all the social consciousness mm-hmm. that they have to be a certain way because people are watching them every second and it affects them that much. So when you got that experience and that gentleman cried because you affected his life or that other gentleman, you know, got off, you know, such a terrible thing and turned his life around because of the walking dead, did that kind of change your mindset? You're like, I'm looking at acting really differently because I'm really making a huge impact on people's lives. Yeah, I mean, it, it did. It kind of expanded the idea in my head about what's possible through this work. When I first kind of like, oh, I want to be an actor. I want to do that. You know, it was for more or less selfish reasons. It's like, you know, I want to I want to tell stories. I want to be in cool things. I want to get a chance to do like cool stuff, like shoot guns and zip line through this thing, through the flames or whatever, you know. Like be like Bruce Willis and Die Hard or something, you know. But then, you know, as I progress and as I, I did different things, uh, and seeing like, oh wow, you know, these stories are can be more than just entertainment, and it it really helped kind of, in you know, just in my in my mind, like sink down to a deeper place about what's possible through this work, and you know, the medium of television and film and. And in theater, they're all so impactful in different ways. And it's like, man, you really can change the world. You can, you can actually change the world through this stuff. It's not just like a pipe dream. It's like, no, you, you're doing it. You're doing stuff you're not even aware of because you can't talk to everybody, especially with a show like Walking Dead. I mean, it's showing, I don't know, like 200 countries or yeah. something. And, and it's like, wow, people are being impacted and, and being a part of it is so humbling. 
and you're like, oh yeah, okay, this is this is even more important than I thought it was. Well, that's- now obviously every single thing on TV is not doing that, so I don't, you know, I don't have the expectation that any project I work on at any time is going to have that amount of impact. But to know that the possibilities out there with things, it's just it's it's a tremendous kind of responsibility and uh, but really really uh, encouraging and and inspiring as well. That's really cool, man. That's good that you feel that way, think that way, and are that way. You are Scott. See, ladies and gems, this is Scott. Right here. <laughs> All right. <laughs> well, you know what, <laughs> Kenrick, you're lovely to chat with, man. Is there any cool projects you're working on that you could tell us? I know there's a lot of secrecy in Hollywood, but is there any new projects, anything happening, anything you want to share with Uh, Let's see. Let's see. There's something, there's something coming up that I don't think – I'm at liberty to really, <laughs> to really share yet. I'll just say it's, uh, I know there's something coming out in December time that I'm excited about. It's a really cool holiday thing. It's, it's something that I've never, uh, no, it's not a holiday movie. Okay. It's not, <laughs> um, it's actually not. Yeah, I know that would be the kind of obvious choice, right? You're like, mm, it rhymes with Mitzvah, you know, like, no. <laughs> um, but it, it's a, uh, it's a cool thing. I've never, I've never worked on something like this before. So it's exciting to kind of step into this craft through a different kind of a different medium. And uh, yeah, I guess that's all I can say. I wish I could say more. Those nasty little NDAs uh, pause you from saying anything, but it's all good. Yeah. You know, it's all gravy. You've been very lovely. Is there anything you want to tell the fans before we head out? Hey, thank you guys for listening. Thank you guys for watching. Thank you guys for your love and support with me, with my family, everything I'm, um, it's, it's each one of you guys that, you know, allow us to do what we do. So thank you. That is wonderful, my man. Well, with that said, Kenrick, we are signing out from another amazing episode of Comic-Con Radio. Kenrick, we do this all the time. We have to blow kisses to the universe. Are you ready? Yeah, let's do Two, it. Two, one, mwah, a billion kisses. Mwah, Dude, a billion kisses oh, Look at universe. that, Kenrick, uh, Mr. Scott from The Walking Dead just kissed all you hundreds of thousands of people listening out there in the global Comic-Con universe. <laughs> 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 and with that said, we're signing out. Thanks, Galaxy. Peace. Peace. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. This is Galaxy signing out from another amazing episode of Comic-Con Radio. Tune in for your daily shows of Comic-Con Radio. Go to comic-con-radio.com. Reach us on social media, Instagram, at Comic-Con Radio. Comic-Con Radio, taking the world one listener at a time. All right, here we go.